sec. Great. <laughs> At 4.11, the baby arrived, quiet and listless. Ten hopelessly tiny fingers dangling in the sterilized space. Lilliputian shoulders sinking into the sky-blue latex of the doctor's left hand. And without music. A nurse leaned over, lips pursed with question. The door was closed. A miniature oxygen mask rested on a stainless steel cart nearby, its thin plastic tubing pooling up beside it, awaiting its chance to kiss the mouth of the child, the child who had come early, too early, unexpectedly early, urgently early. In view of the human frame, the hospital room paused the way an acrobat pauses at the height of her routine, in the air, in the space between swings, between safety, between the collective breath of everyone under the tent, the circus gone silent. No movement, no sound. Just one day earlier, the still pregnant mother had skimmed through an electronic article about the viability of her unborn child at its current gestational age. It began with a celebratory line that read, Your child might survive if it was born today. The blogger had composed it with pure intentions. Nonetheless, the mother had read it unaware that the piece, with its purpley suburban, Your baby is now the size of a Japanese eggplant heading, was actually an omen. And now, in the delivery room, almost three months before the due date, it's bouncy. Your child might survive if it was born today. Announcement felt woefully indecisive, if not sinister. Might survive. All the clocks were asleep. The next few seconds took an hour to pass. Every torso began bending towards the foot of the bed, as if the two-pound newborn were a celestial body with its own unique gravitational pull compelling the mooning hearts to draw closer and take notice. Even the walls were curious, leaning in, and the room became small. To the untrained ear, the timber of a hospital can be unnerving. The urgency of rubber-wheeled beds racing, high-pitched pulses from heartbeats and heart attacks, the foreign chatter of neosinephrine, ad, debutamine, patent ductus, arteriosus, metastic, site, acetabular, fracture, and the more familiar phrases, we can't proceed until, we'll have to wait until, we won't know until, the hum of alarming mechanics, oscillators, compressors, endless palliative repetitions, chemicals, drips, brightly labeled gases pushing through tanks and tubes into noses and necks, every sudden unanticipated movement by the staff, by the monitor, by the laboring chest, and the muted epidemic of inquiries. Why this? Why God? Why me? Every hospital conversation seems inappropriately loud or uncomfortably hush. None of the volumes are correct. Caring, concerned aunts and co-workers wade through the long corridors, the labyrinth of swishing, magnetically unlocking automated double doorways and alternating currents of shift-changing medical workers. There is laughter and unfiltered squeals, too, which only serves to exasperate those already bearing an extremity of emotion. But even these are much preferred to that one dreaded tone, the sound of nothingness. The absent song, the end of conversation, the after goodbye, the empty sheets. Silence has long been the most unnerving sound of all because it is the sound of the dead. A light flickered, then dimmed, clamping one of the red translucent feet between his thumb and index finger. The doctor peered at the humble form shuddered eyelids and breadth of raindrops, hoping that a firm stimulation might provoke the little one's mouth to gasp. The mother wished to weep, so did the angels. But there was no time. 
before the terrible grief could be realized on the earth, the heavens interrupted there in the pale room. God breathed, and the lungs of the child ballooned into motion. The fragile lips parted, and out came a solitary cry. A cry that swam through the air, sweeping around the doctor's uncombed hair, a gold and purple whimper that began like a, a muted cello, and then swelled into a brassy dawning, a windstorm arrival, a dream crashing into the eardrums of the nurses, wrapping around the mother's bosom in its first embrace, assuring her, prompting her to glance at the clocks on the wall and see the little hands still ticking, and the future still coming. It was a cry that rang and rose until the delivery ward was flooded with its shrill celebration, soaking into the floors, the cabinets seeping underneath the doorway, down the fluorescent lit hallways, kicking off the walls, rushing recklessly around the corners, a headlong cry, running with its eyes closed, flinging open the doors of every bedridden patient and unsuspecting resident, tambourines ringing, bells tolling, a holy cry that carried with it the light of its maker, drawing back the curtains and pouring out into the world through all the glass panes a siren, soaring, a single wailing cry of possibility and innocence, renaissance, future, bliss. Out the windows, through the cracks, tearing down the buckling blacktop streets, awakening old men on their porches, on stoops, waking them up with the sound of raw and original youth. That perpetrated miracle of a soul arriving in the open air, in the image of Elohim, the incomprehensible inception of consciousness and character and creativity. Like Tito Puente's first strike of the timbales and MJ's first dribble. Like Jane Austen's first story. Like the natural harmonics of a string. Like a forest awakening from winter. Like 3.14159265359 and the way some things were written down long before they existed. Like August dusk. Like a Susian heart growing three sizes that day. Like the thick mist of a river careening over the cliffs above. Like music. Like even God had teared up while writing it down. Like walking down the aisle. Like opening a package that you weren't expecting and finding within it the truest form of happiness. One perfect, piercing cry from a baby's mouth. That song from the Creator, whose lyrics echo again and again. Life is come. Life is come. Life is come.